Today we're going to move on to uh, another topic I've kept hinting at all semester, but it's finally here, which is to think more explicitly about equity or fairness. So our discussions this semester have been almost solely couched in the language of efficiency. We talk about maximizing social welfare. Uh, we talk about the total size of the triangle and the squares. But we don't actually talk about who gets what. We very much stayed away from equity concerns and focused just on efficiency concerns. <clears throat> the problem is that doesn't lead us very far in life because you can have many outcomes that are equally efficient but have different equity outcomes consequences. The best example, of course, is perfect competition versus a perfectly price discriminating monopolist. Remember, under perfect competition, you maximize welfare. But a perfectly price discriminating monopolist also maximizes welfare. The difference is, in the latter case, the monopolist gets all the surplus, when the former case, it's shared between producers and consumers. So it's sort of weird to say we're indifferent between those two outcomes, between one where Apple gets all our money and one where Apple gets some of our money and we get some of our money. Seems like kind of a strange, uh, strange to say we're different between those outcomes. So now, that's sort of the, in some sense, that's the easy case. So we're talking about equity efficiency. In some sense, the easy case is the case where there's two equally efficient outcomes and they have different equity consequences. That's the rare case. The more common case is what we call the equity efficiency trade-off, which is that by making distributions more equal, we are going to induce inefficiencies. That the act of making distribution more equal is going to introduce inefficiencies in the system. And that's where things get really interesting. OK? So in other words, so the best way to think about this, I find most helpful, is due to a famous economist named Arthur Oaken. And his thought example of the leaky bucket. Oaken's thought example was the following. Imagine that the way the government distributed money from the rich to the poor was literally they went to the rich, had the rich put money in a bucket, and they carried it and dumped it out in front of the poor. Imagine that's the way distribution happened. Well, in that world, if I told you that every dollar a rich person put in the bucket got carried along and got handed to a poor person, so Bill Gates' dollar became a homeless guy's dollar, Probably most of us would think that was OK. It, I think the vast majority of Americans would say, yeah, probably the homeless guy could use a dollar more than Bill Gates could. OK? But now imagine that there was a leak in the bucket. Imagine Bill Gates put 100 pennies in, but along the way to the poor person, it leaked out. And so we dumped it from the poor person that was less than 100. Now, then the question is, how much leakage? Well, if the leakage was one penny out of 100, you probably wouldn't change your mind. Would it change your mind if it was 20 pennies out of 100? 50 pennies out of 100? What if it was 100 pennies out of 100? What if taking a dollar from Bill Gates, by the time we got to the poor person, it was all gone? At what point would you say, you know what? I don't think that's a good idea anymore. And really, that's a great way of thinking about the equity efficiency trade-off. How much efficiency are you willing to give up to redistribute from rich to poor? And the efficiency you give up is represented by the leakage in the bucket. OK? Now, what we're going to do in this lecture and next Monday's lecture is we're going to discuss this equity efficiency trade-off in four steps. Okay? The first step is going to be talking about valuation. That is, taking the difficult step we've already taken so far and asking, how does society feel about some people versus other people? So far, we just thought of one generic person, and they're represented by total surplus. But in fact, we have a distribution of people. And how do economists think about taking money away from person A and giving it to person B? That's a new topic for us. The second thing we're going to talk about is what do we know about um, the facts on inequality? What do we know about what's actually happened to the distribution of resources uh, in the US at a point in time and over time? The third thing is we're going to talk about the sources of leakage. That is, why does the bucket leak in practice? Why do we typically think there is an equity efficiency trade-off? Why can't we just take the dollar from the rich guy and give it to the poor guy? What caused the leakage? And then finally, we're going to talk about some examples of transfer mechanisms. We're going to talk about what society does in practice to transfer 
from rich to poor and how it works and what, what the ultimate leakage looks like. Okay, So that's going to be our goal in the next two lectures. It's going to be to think about this equity efficiency trade-off. So to start that goal, we have to start with this first issue of choosing the social optimum. That is, how do we evaluate transfers from one party to another party? OK? And so to rank outcomes, what we're going to do is use the same thing we always do when we want to think about trade-offs, which is we're going to do a constrained maximization exercise. When I want to think about your trade-off between cookies and pizza, I did a constrained optimization for your utility function subject to your budget constraint. Well, I now want to think about your trade-off between me and Patricia. Now, instead, we're going to need a different utility function. In fact, we're going to use what we call a social welfare function. A social welfare function is basically society's utility function. How does society value different individuals? OK? So loosely, so loosely speaking, social welfare function is some function of utility of person 1, comma, utility of person 2, comma, dot, 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 Come utility of person 350 million if it's the US. Okay? So it's some aggregation function, just like we mathematically aggregate your taste for pizza and cookies. Now we're going to mathematically aggregate all society's utility to get a social welfare function. So for example, consider figure 21.1. Okay? Let's think of society as only two people, Homer and Ned. Let's imagine that's all of society, because once again, it's always these two by two examples are easy. OK? What we've drawn here are what's called iso-welfare curves. What these are are basically society's indifference curves. Just like if these x, if these x and y axis said pizza and cookies, I would draw an indifference curve between pizza and cookies. Now I'm drawing society's indifference curve between Homer and Ned. So in other words, what this says is that society's indifferent between Homer having u1 super h and Ned having u1 super n versus the meet Homer having u2 super h and Ned having u2 super n. Those are, those are combinations of resources across which society is indifferent. And much like any other indifference curve, further out is better. We'd all prefer both Homer and Ned to have more. More is better. OK, so that's easy. The further out the ISO welfare curve goes, the happier you are. And along the ISO welfare curve are allocations of resources across individuals among which we're indifferent. OK? Now, the question is, that's all well and easy to graph as a theoretical proposition. But in practice, what does a social welfare function look like? Utility functions, I just wrote down with utility function. And you took it as sort of, you know, I wrote down square root. We worked with that. But there were some properties we wrote down that sort of gave us a sense of what utility functions look like. Social welfare functions are much more open, because they don't come from introspection about your preferences. They come from introspection about society's preferences, which are much harder. So what we do here is we talk about some typical forms of social welfare functions that we use in economics. The most common form is what's called utilitarian social welfare function. Utilitarian social welfare function. This is due to the philosopher Jeremy Bentham. If you ever visit University College London, actually if you did until about 15 years ago, you could see Jeremy Bentham's head. It was on display. He was a famous philosopher there. But apparently the students would take it out and use it for soccer. So they took it off display. You can't see it anymore. But he's a famous philosopher. And he gave with the idea of utilitarianism. And basically, utilitarianism is it simply says the social welfare function is simply the linear aggregation of every individual's utility. So social welfare function is simply u1 plus u2 plus u3 plus, plus u350 million. So the US social welfare function is literally just measure everyone's utility, add it up, and that's a social welfare function. And in some sense, it's a natural starting point. right? You just say, look, it's just a linear. It's like having a linear utility function. It's a, it's a linear utility function. Now, let's be clear. What this says is that I don't care any more about anybody in society. So I don't care any more or less about Bill Gates and the homeless guy. I treat them. I'm, I, I'm indifferent between them. Okay? But does this mean I wouldn't want to transfer money from Bill Gates to the homeless guy? In fact, I still would want to transfer, and why? Depending on the leakage. Why? Because of the mission. 
Yeah, exactly. I care about the utility the same, but the next dollar is not worth anything to Bill Gates. It's worth a lot to the homeless guy. So a utilitarian social welfare function, which is a natural starting point, I don't think of it particularly liberal. Okay, it's a natural starting point. You're just adding them up. Ends up with a very, in some sense, redistributive conclusion, which is that you want to distribute from rich to poor. Indeed, what the optimum with utilitarian social welfare function is that you want to redistribute until marginal utilities are equal. So this calls, this social order function calls for fairly radical redistribution. This says you want to redistribute until utilities are equal. Marginal utilities are equal, I'm sorry, yeah. Well, and once again, let's, you're right. I mean, you just add people and subtract people. It wouldn't be a problem. Uh, but, but for now, let's just assume the population is because it's got one given society. OK, so if two people, it's just Ned and Homer. Just to add them up, all it says is, as Ned has more resources than Homer, we're going to redistribute. Indeed, with this function, if we make the assumption that total social welfare is, total social resources are fixed, that society is a fixed budget constraint that can't change, OK, then what does this function imply would be the optimal distribution of income? So ignoring the fact that people might work less or more hard, ignore that. Imagine it's just a total amount of money society has. If that's, util if that's your social welfare function, what's the optimal distribution of income? Yeah. Are you saying that everyone equally has to Yes, everyone, yes, good point. Fixed resources and identical utility functions. Great point. Yeah, exactly, great, great catch. If there's a fixed bundle of income and everyone has identical utility functions, then we simply would want everyone to have the same amount of money. Why? Because giving someone a dollar would make them less happy than taking away from someone else would make them sad. It's all about diminishing marginal utility, just like we talked about last time. So now, that might not be true. For example, you guys said, you know, Scrooge McDuck is? Hey, Scrooge McDuck? Raise your hand if you know Scrooge McDuck. OK, not bad. Scrooge McDuck is this comic character when I was a kid who used to like to dive and swim in his money. Now, he clearly had a higher marginal utility the next dollar than I do. OK, so if Scrooge McDuck really likes money, we might want to let Scrooge McDuck have some extra money. But if utility functions are identical and social resources are fixed, this is one equal distribution of income. That's really radical. OK, that's beyond what any country in the world does, a perfectly equal distribution of income. But it comes naturally out of this fairly plain vanilla social welfare function. Quite a striking finding, right? Now, but in fact, if we think of this as sort of our starting point, Bentham was actually conservative. This is typically viewed as sort of a conservative starting point, even though it has a very liberal conclusion. The more liberal extreme is what we call a Rawlsian social welfare function. Due to the philosopher uh, James, I think, Rawls, who was at Harvard. John Rawls, I'm sorry. He said the goal of society is to maximize the well-being of its worst off member. So a Rawlsian social welfare function is the minimum of u1, comma u2, comma dot, dot, dot. In other words, all you care about is the worst off person in society. OK? So Rawlsian social welfare function would say all you care about is the worst off person in society. OK. Now, you, let's think this crazy. Let's think about where Rawls came, came at this from. Rawls came at this from the concept that he called the veil of ignorance, which he said, look, before you were born, you know nothing about what you're going to be. You could be born to rich or poor, healthy, sick. You have no idea. You're just a little embryo. Okay? From that perspective, he said, what you would want is to make sure that you're going to be OK. And so from that perspective, society should want to minimize the well-being of the worst off member. That was his rationalization. But this has really radical implications. Not only does this say we want an equal distribution of income, this says we would destroy any amount of money of the rich to give some money to the poor. So imagine what this says, if I could take, if everyone's distribution of income was equal in this class, let's say our society, OK, except Patricia has $40,000 more than, more than everyone else, then what that would say is we would happily take $40,000 away from Patricia to give $1 to me, OK? Because I'm, like everyone else, the worst off member. But let's say I'm $1 less than the rest of you. Make it easy. So you all have the same amount of money. I have $1 less. She has $40,000 more. Rawlsian would say we'd happily take away her $40,000 and give me a dollar. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. OK? But it's one sort of extreme, and it's basically this notion of kind of, it's in some sense Rawlsian of an extremely risk averse embryo. 
gives you the Rawlsian. The idea that I don't know what my income is going to be, but I want to make sure I'm not poor, then I would want sort of a Rawlsian social welfare function. Okay, so that's that's sort of the liberal um, uh, extreme. Okay, now there's two other views which are harder to write down mathematically, at least in the context of 1401, but are important. There is let's take the most conservative extreme. So if Rawlsian is the most liberal extreme, the most conservative extreme would be uh, the Nozick Nozickian argument. It's not really a social welfare function. His argument is that. We should never redistribute income. We should only redistribute opportunities. In other words, once everyone has equal opportunities, then we should just roll the dice and let things lay in what they may. So here, here's an example. Let's say all of us are born with the same opportunities in life, and we end up where we are today. And let's say that you guys are willing to pay me $10 every lecture to hear me lecture. Well, if that's true at the end of the semester, I have a lot more money than you. Nozick would say, well, why should I be taxed and given to you? That makes no sense. You voluntarily paid me. Why should LeBron James are voluntarily paying to see him play? Why should he then be taxed on the money we voluntarily gave him? So Nozick's view is as long as we all start with an equality of opportunity, let the dice roll. If someone has more talents and skills and people want to pay them, then let them keep it. So basically, Rawls' idea, uh, Nozick's idea, is to essentially e equalize opportunity and let, let the dice roll, land where they may. Yeah. Opportunity that can be regulated, or like, is it like because I, I was thinking that probably LeBron James might be like called and fit, had like doesn't have equal opportunity. Right. So there's two problems with the Nozickian view. One is what is opportunity? What does equal opportunity mean? And the answer is it's not clear. There's genetic equal opportunity. There's the fact that if I'm born in poverty, I go to lower quality schools, so I don't really have an equal opportunity. I went to a ritzy, you know, public high school in New Jersey because my parents were well off. Like someone who went to high school in some poor town in New Jersey didn't have the same opportunities I did. So the first problem with this argument is that, in some sense, it's impossible to equalize opportunity. It sort of starts with a false premise. Okay. The second problem with this argument is it ignores luck. It ignores luck. Okay. Which is that, in fact, if you look at why some people are rich and some people are poor, even with equal opportunities, a lot of it is not skill or talent. It's luck. They were in the right place at the right time. They had the right parents who gave them the right you know, inheritance. Uh, they met the right person in business school and went on to, and that person brought them into their company. It's luck. Indeed, if you try to explain differences in income by any measure of skill we have, you can never explain even half of the differences in income across people. A lot of it appears to be luck. Well, in that case, we would then not want to just let lucky people be richer than unlucky people. That doesn't really seem to make sense. Well, I want skilled people richer than unskilled people, but it doesn't seem, it seems like we want to redistribute against from the lucky to the unlucky. So that's the other problem with the, with the Nozickian notion. And then finally, the fourth approach, the fourth approach is um, a totally alternative view, which we call commodity egalitarianism. Commodity egalitarianism. This view is simply saying, look, who cares how much money I have relative to you? All that matters is that you can live a decent life. So this says what matters is not relative income, but absolute resources. What matters is making sure everyone in society has food and shelter and, I would argue, health care, et cetera. A set of basic things everyone should have. And then above that, who cares? So in some sense, commodity egalitarianism is kind of a mix of Rawls and Nozick. It cares about the minimum, saying we've got to break sure everyone has a decent standard of living. But above that, let's roll the dice. As long as, we have, as long as we're providing a decent standard of living for everyone, that if someone can make a lot of money, let's let them. OK? So this is, this is a very interesting view. And it basically talks about the view of kind of should we give people money or stuff? And so the commodity egalitarianism view says, that, look, it's let's worry less about money and more about stuff. Let's make sure everybody has enough stuff to lead a decent life. And then we'll roll the dice from there. So let me start. If I was not clear enough at all, none of these are right. Okay? These are all alternative views. 
It is harder to write down to make an assumption about a social welfare function than it is about a utility function. We have less primitives to draw on. But the point is these are all different ways of thinking about the trade-off. We can't avoid thinking about the trade-off. That's why, once again, we're the dismal science, OK? Because nothing's free. We can't avoid thinking about the trade-off. We have to think about redistribution. And these give us different frameworks for thinking about that. OK? Questions about that? Yeah? What? For like um, the Nozickian and the yeah. other one, what happens if like there are individuals that just don't, they, they always make like, they always make the wrong decision, like they'll spend all their money like irresponsibly and therefore like they can't have like, a good standard. Well, I mean, that, that's a very interesting question. So I think Nozick, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know how hard-hearted a guy Nozick is. But if he took Nozickian view to the extreme, as long as that person had an equal opportunity, then they should just die. I mean, you know, they had an equal opportunity. If they made a series of bad decisions, why should we care? Now, that's obviously an extreme view, but I think that would be the, 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 the view there. Whereas commodity totalitarianism would say, look, let's at least make sure that despite their bad decisions, they don't starve. But we still don't want to make them rich if they're making bad decisions. So let's just set a minimum and get them to that and then let things go from there. OK? Yeah? That's a great segue to what I'm going to talk about next, which is let's actually talk about territories in the practice and measuring inequality. And I'm going to come back to your basic income point in a couple minutes. So let's talk about actually measuring inequality. Okay? And the reason we know I talk about this is because it highlights how important this issue is. So let's go to some facts. These are from my uh, textbook from 1441. Okay? So Go to figure 21-2. Ignore the last row for a second. Focus on the first five rows. What the first five rows show is the percent of income received by each quintile, or each fifth, of the income distribution. In other words, each row is 20% of people. So the first row is the poorest 20% of people. The next row is the second poorest 20% of people, and so on. The numbers in each cell are the share of income held by that quintile. In other words, if the distribution of income was totally equal, every one of these numbers would be 20. If distribution of income was totally equal, every quintile would have 20. But in fact, that's never been true in any society ever in history. The richest always have more than the poorest. We have no perfect distribution of income. And you see that if you look at in 1967, when these data first are reliably collected, you see that the highest 20% of individuals had about 10 times as much as the lowest 20%. Okay? That there was a lot of inequality. Okay? Now, if you roll forward till about 1980, that gap was shrinking. So you saw that the highest 20% share was about fixed, but the lowest 20% was rising. But then if you look since 1980, that gap has widened enormous, widened enormously. To the point now where the 2013 is the latest here, but the facts haven't really changed. The richest 20% of Americans earn more than half the income in America. And the poorest 20% earn only about 3% of the income in America. So inequalities widen massively in the US. OK? How does that put us in international terms? Uh, oh, OK. And I'm sorry. And then the last row was the share of the top 5%. This is particularly striking. In fact, go to the next page. This is a graph of the share of the top 1% of income holders in America. So this is the share of income held by the 1% richest Americans. You can see that in the early 20th century, that was pretty high, almost 20%. It then fell down to about 10% by the early 1970s. It's now up, and by the latest date, up to about 25%. It's higher than it was at the beginning of the 20th century. So the 1% of richest Americans have about 25% of the income earned in society. So it's extremely unequal income distribution. I'm, once again, I'm not saying bad or good. I'm making a positive statement. Unequal is irrefutable. Bad or good, we'll get to. But it's irrefutable, very unequal income distribution. It's also irrefutable. We have a much more unequal distribution of income than the rest of the world. So in figure 21.4, we compare the facts for the US to the rest of the OECD, which is a set of developed economies. Yeah? Before or after the tax? After, uh, that's a great point. This is, all this is all before tax. Before tax. But if anything, if you add taxes, it makes us look even worse relative to other countries, because our taxes are less progressive than other countries. OK? This is before tax and before transfers. So if you look at other, so this list is a lot of numbers. Look at the bottom line. The bottom line is the average across all non-US countries of the share of income held by each part of the income distribution. 
and uh, the next to bottom line, the bottom line is the US. So we say the bottom 10% of income distribution, on average across these countries, has 3% of income. Indeed, nowhere except for Mexico is the number lower than the 1.6% in the US. Likewise, if you look at the top 10% of income earners, on average across these countries, uh, they earn 25% of the income. In the US, it's 30%. And indeed, nowhere is the number higher than in, uh, except in Mexico and Turkey. So we are the most unequal country, except for Mexico, in, of, on this list. Once again, not saying good or bad, just saying the facts. Okay, we're gonna come to, we're gonna come to how we think about good or bad. Okay? So those are the facts about inequality. But as the question here pointed out, it's not clear we care about inequality. Indeed, in a standard economic framework, I don't care about inequality. My utility is a function of my consumption, not your consumption. So standard economic framework, I don't care about inequality. I just care about what I have. And that speaks more to the commodity, commodity egalitarianism view, which is are, how are we doing in making sure people have enough to live? And to do that, um, we say we move from, so when we talk about inequality, Inequality is a measure of relative distribution. We want to move to something which is a measure of absolute, absolute just income, and that's what we call the poverty line. The poverty line in the US is a measure of absolute deprivation. What share of Americans are earning less than some minimum standard they need to live? Now, you can immediately see the problem. With inequality, it's unit free, right? I simply compare dollars to dollars. Once I start going here, I have to make a judgment, which is what is deprivation? What do you need to live? So in some sense, this makes more sense. Absolutely makes more sense. In some sense, it makes more sense to think about, do people have enough to live on? But it is more difficult because you have to draw a judgment about what it is. So the judgment we've drawn is what's called the poverty line. The poverty line was invented by a civil servant in the 1960s, Molly Orshansky. She said, well, what does it take to live in America? She said, well, the typical person spends about a third of their budget on food in the 1960s. So let's cost out the cost of a nutritionally adequate bundle of food, multiply it by three, and call that the poverty line. She did that, and that's still the poverty line. All we've done is taken that and updated it by inflation. Remember we talked about the CPI, the inflation rate? All we've done is taken Molly Orshansky's poverty line and updated by inflation ever since. And what do we get? Well, if you look at table 21.5, this shows you the poverty line in the US today. It varies by family size because you need more resources with a bigger family, but not one to one because of economies of scale in the household. You don't need twice as much money to have a household with two people because you, you still only need one living unit. You can share cookware. You, only, you, can, you, only, you have to heat. Heating for two people is a much more expensive than heating for one person, et cetera. So I think there's economies of scale within the household. So poverty line does not go up, does not double with every person you, does not, does not double when you go from one to two. It less than doubles. And you can see this scale. Essentially, we say that uh, this is 2015, it's, so it's higher now. But basically it says that one person with income below 11,170 is living in poverty. And a family of four, it's about 24,250. It's about 24 to 20. So we basically say a family below $25,000, a family below $25,000 is living in poverty. OK? Now, is that, um, is that the right number? Well, yeah. Does it differ based on where in the country you live? There's a number of reasons it might not be the right number. First of all, it does not differ based on what country you live. So if you are, you guys don't know because you're sh sheltered, but if you tried to, right now, try to take $25,000, go live in Boston, there's no way. I mean, there's no, it's just like impossible. Whereas in rural Mississippi, you can probably do okay in $25,000. So, but it doesn't vary by area. Uh, it doesn't vary. It also, um, uh, the poverty line calculation is all messed up now because when she did it, food was a third of people's budgets. It's now more like 20% of people's budgets. It's fallen enormously. And the elements, the other elements that poor people have to pay, notably housing and medical care, have gone up much faster and the poverty line hasn't accounted for that. Um, so in fact, there's lots of reasons to think this line is problematic. Nonetheless, it's very hard to change it. Indeed, I was in the US government for 14 months, and I only went to one super duper secret meeting. Okay, I went to a lot of meetings with the president, stuff like that. 
But one time, my secretary said, there's a meeting, and I can't tell you what it's about. I can't even tell you where it is. When the time comes, they will come get you and bring you there. I was like, Jesus, it's nuclear war. Like, what the hell? So they brought me to this room. We're all in this room. I'm like, what's going on? They're like, we need to discuss revising the poverty line. I'm like, what? Well, why is it super secret? Because the US today distributes more than a trillion dollars a year based on the poverty line. So any changes you make is going to create winners and losers. And the losers are going to be really mad. Okay? And as a result, it's been incredibly hard to change the poverty line. Because for example, let's say we change it to recognize the fact that it should be higher in New York than Mississippi. Well, that means New Yorkers would win and Mississippians would lose. Bad news politically. New Yorkers would be happy, Mississippians would be sad. But because of the Michigan Marge utility and the laws of politics, the guys who are sad make more noise than the guys who are happy. So it's very, very hard to change this, despite its, despite its problematic features. Nonetheless, it's still a useful benchmark. It is useful that it's fixed over time, because it allows us to essentially see how things have evolved over time. And we can see that in figure 21.6. This shows the poverty rate over time. And it shows it for everybody. That's the red. It shows it for the elderly. That's the blue. For kids, that's the green. And for non-elderly adults, that's the yellow. So what do we see here? We see a couple things. First of all, for every group, poverty fell enormously during the 1960s. That's the so-called war on poverty. We introduced a number of social programs that lowered poverty enormously during the 1960s. Okay? For the elderly, it kept going down. And the elderly went from the most impoverished group in society to the least. For kids, it bounced back up. And now kid poverty rates are nearly as high as they were back in the early 1960s. For the rest of folks, it sort of went down and flattened. Yeah? How do you determine how much wealth a kid has? Uh, it's based on their family's income. So this is not wealth, it's income. It's based on their so basically, when asked, does a kid live in poverty, it's like, do they live in a household that's below the poverty line? OK? So the bottom line is, so think about so this is families with kids is another way to think about this. The bottom line is, Essentially, poverty hasn't done a whole lot. We haven't done a whole lot on poverty in the last 50 years. Okay? We sort of lowered a lot in the 60s, and then it's been, it's been bounced up and down, but it's been pretty flat. Okay, is, is, is the result there. Now, so the bottom line is, I, my, now my take, now I'm going to draw a judgment. My take is, along either of these dimensions, we don't look so hot. Okay? We're the most unequal nation in the world, and we have, you know, uh, still, if you look at all people, we have 15% of our people living below some standard of absolute deprivation. Literally saying, we are accepting that 15% of people in America cannot afford to live. Okay, we are sort of accepting that, including uh, you know, more than 20% of kids. Okay, so I don't think we're doing that well, but in some sense, this is even the most, yeah, go ahead. Uh, 18 to six, uh, 64 people, yeah. are those like single people? Because I imagine like, Kids would fall within I mean, I that's like the happen. average of all 18 to 64, including those that have kids and don't. So look at childless 18 to 64, that would come down more. So it's the average. Now, this is a striking set of facts, but not, to my mind, the most striking. Probably the most striking fact that probably, probably the fact I've seen that has the most influence on me in the last 10 years is shown in figure 21.7. This is a figure put together in the wake of the Freddie Gray riots in Baltimore. You may have heard about those. That's when a uh, uh, prisoner was beat to death in the back of a police van. And he was from the area of Sandtown. OK? Sandtown, Winchester, which is a super bad area. Think The Wire, if you've seen The Wire, like super bad area of Baltimore. OK? About three miles away is an area called Roland Park, which is a very rich area. The average life expectancy in Roland Park is 84 years. That's a, above the US average. That's pretty good. The average life expectancy three miles away is 67 years, which is below North Korea and what it was around World War II in the US. Three miles. And we get a 17-year difference in the average life expectancy. What's going on? Well, what you'd expect. People are way poorer. In Soundtown, the average income is 107,000. I'm sorry, in Roland Park, it's 107,000. In Sandtown, it's 24,000. The average income is below the poverty line. In Roland Park, 2.5% of kids live in poverty. In Sandtown, it's 55% of kids. Okay? 
So basically, you have incredibly, incredible inequality in short distances. To me, this is striking because it really brings home how much it brings home the inequality by putting it in such sort of close geographic terms. So we have a lot of inequality. There's no, there's no question. And this certainly motivates, I think it's hard to look at facts like this, regardless of your political stripe, and not worry, not at least worry, and consider the fact that there may be some role for government redistribution. Okay? But that, that's not the end of the discussion. Okay? This, in some sense, think of this as sort of this part of the lecture is sort of the benefits of government redistribution. The benefits of government redistribution is we have incredible inequality, incredible poverty uh, all around the country. Now we have to come, but of course in economics, nothing free. Now we have to come to the costs of redistribution. The benefits are clear. What about the costs? And so now we have to talk about uh, the efficiency costs or the leakage. Efficiency costs costs of redistribution. Or in other words, how big is the leakage? So going back to Oaken, I hope that these figures inspire you to think we ought to be putting some money in buckets and giving it to poor people. But now the question is, should we? What if it all leaks out? How leaky is the bucket? And that's what we need to talk about now. And basically, leakages in the bucket come from three sources. The first and least important source is administrative costs. Literally, you've got to pay someone to carry the bucket. Okay? So if you put a dollar in and carry the bucket, he's going to take some money out for the, for the right of carrying the bucket. That's small, but non-trivial, maybe low single digits. The second source of leakage is the efficiency costs of taxation. If you tax people and take their money away, they may work less hard. Think about the extreme case where I'm going to say, I'm going to go back to the utilitarian world. I'm going to tell everyone we're going to equalize income. That means that everyone, no matter what they make, is going to have the same amount of money. Why would you work? I mean, you guys would because you're tools. But like, why, would, what, wh why, would, like, why would like regular people work? Okay, They wouldn't. Because no matter what you do, you end up with the same income. It's 100% tax. So why would you work? And that's extreme. But the point is, the extreme example makes the point that when you tax people, there's potential efficiency costs in terms of them earning less income. The third issue is the efficiency costs of transfers, which is when you give people money, and you give that money, when you give people money, they may also work less. So not only might I work less when you tax me, I might work less if you give me money. Why should you go to work if you're sending me a check? So not only would an equal distribution of income lead me to work less because I'm being taxed, lead me to work less because I'm getting money. So why should I bother working? As long as leisure is a normal good, remember. I don't want to work. So if you're just sending me money, why would I go to work? OK? So to see this, we can sort of summarize this with, with one example. So let's go to figure 21.8. And I want to sort of walk through. It's a fairly complicated example. Let's walk through. This is a simple illustration of a tax and transfer scheme of the type we have in America. We start in this example with an individual earning $20 an hour. So the slope of this line is negative $20 an hour. This person can work two thousand. And on, remember, we don't model work. We model leisure. I almost made the mistake. Remember, we don't model the bad, we model the good. We don't model labor, we model leisure. Let's say that the max leisure you can take is 2,000, 2000 hours. Okay? So you can either take 2,000 hours of leisure and, earn, and consume nothing, or you could take no leisure and consume 40,000. And let's say consumption's income, no savings in this model. Okay? So you're in $20 an hour, you consume your whole income, and you can take up to 2,000 hours of leisure. Okay? So your budget constraint is the dark line running from 40,000 on the y-axis, 2,000 on the x-axis. OK? Now, let's say that we're going to put in, into this budget constraint, we're going to add two things. The first is a transfer program to the poor. We're worried about po poverty. So we're going to have a new program that says that every American gets at least $10,000. Every American gets $10,000. But as their income goes up, we're going to take that away. 
So what we're going to say is essentially we have a transfer program. The transfer program is going to be of the form the transfer you get is the max of 0, comma, 10,000 minus your income. That's our transfer program. So if your income's 0, you get 10,000. If your income is 10,000, you get 0. We're just making sure everybody gets $10,000. We don't care about people having more than that, so we're going to take it away. We're going to say, look, we want to make sure you have $10,000, but above that, we don't care about you. Okay, so if you're someone earning $100,000, this program's irrelevant. Okay, if you're someone earning $5,000, we'll give you another $5,000 to get you up to 10. Okay, so that's based on our transfer program. This is typically the way welfare programs work around the world. Okay, essentially they give you money, but then they take it away as you get richer to make sure the money's targeted to the poorest people. Okay, so that's our transfer program. That's the first thing it's going to do. The second thing it's good. The second thing we're going to transfer, but we've got to pay for this. So to pay for this, we have to have a tax. Now let's say we only want to tax the rich. You don't want to tax the poor. We want to give money to the poor. So let's say our tax program is of the following form: anyone making more than twenty thousand dollars per year pays a twenty percent tax rate on the income above twenty thousand. So no one's taxed on their first twenty thousand, but on every dollar above twenty thousand, you pay twenty cents to the government. It's what's called a marginal tax. Okay, it's a marginal. You have a marginal tax rate of 20%. What does marginal mean? It means you only pay on the next dollar. So it's a marginal tax of marginal tax 20% above 20K. OK, so once you earn 20K, up 20K, you pay nothing. Once you've earned 20K on every dollar above 20K, you face a marginal tax rate of 20%. You pay 20 cents of every dollar to the government. OK, so that is our tax program. Not looking at the diagram. Do people understand how these programs work? Forgetting the diagram. Yeah, Manny. Uh, other countries, uh, like, is there any like data that's showing like how this affects the number, like the number of hours people work? That's exactly what we're getting to. Um, that's our concern, right? Is that that's my point here? Is that this might lower how many hours people work? Okay, and let's talk about why. But the question about the logistics of these programs first. Okay, well, let's talk about how it affects hours worked. Let's go to the diagram. Okay, let's go to the diagram. Let's consider several different people. Start with person A. Person A earned, let, they earned some, they, before this program was in place, they would have chosen to be a high leisure, low consumption person. When this program is in place, we tell them, look, person A, you can get more of both, more leisure and more consumption. All you have to do is quit, stop working. You move from point A to point D. You get more leisure and more consumption. So that naturally happens. So everyone earning less than 10,000 immediately quits. Once again, assuming leisure is a normal good, immediately quits. Because look, once you're below 10,000, it's 100% tax rate. Why work? So anyone who would have earned less than 10,000 doesn't work. Because you're just going to get back to the government anyway. Why do you care? That's person A. What about person B? Person B earns more than 10,000. But note. Their indifference curve crosses below the new budget constraint. Let me step back. The new budget constraint is the red segments plus the black segment in the middle. The new budget constraint runs from 32,000 on the y-axis. It intersects the black line, the old budget constraint at $20,000. It's the old budget constraint from $20,000 down to $10,000, and it becomes the new red segment. I should have mentioned that. So the new budget constraint is the two red segments and the black segment in between. That's the new budget constraint. So let's look at person B. What happens to person B and why? What does person B do? Yeah. Why? Because it's a higher indifference curve. Right. Cri crucially, since person B's indifference curve crosses the red line, we know they must be better off at point D than at point B. Because we know that since point D is above that line, that, that's a higher indifference curve than they're on at point B. So not only do you cause every person below 10,000 to quit, you also cause some people above 10,000 to quit. Why? Well, they give up a little consumption, they get a ton of leisure. So let's say someone's earning 11, 12,000, like, wait a second. All my work is only getting me 1,000, $2,000 over quitting. I might as well quit. So this welfare program causes a ton of people to quit. All the people who are going to earn very little quit, and some of the people who are going to earn somewhat little quit. OK? But that's not all. Let's look at person C. Person C used to work 
a certain amount, you know, used to work, you know, uh, more than 1,000 hours, take less than 1,000 hours of leisure. Now what happens? Well, what happens, forget the diagram, step back. If I take someone and introduce a marginal tax rate, what happens to their labor supply and why? What happens to their leisure and why? So I take you, you're working, let's say you were, you're taking uh, 800 hours of leisure, doesn't matter what the exact number was. I then come and say you have a 20% tax rate and every earnings above $20,000. How does that affect your, your leisure? Yeah? Well, that's why increase it. In you would increase it, why? Because then after above 10000 um, you get like, I guess you would get less money, but I guess maybe less utility out of above ten k because you're right. getting to the numbers. You might increase it, but what might else you do? Yeah. The wage effectively decreases, so the price of leisure decreases, so you'd be taking more leisure. Right. You, I, I think that you increase leisure. That's what he said. Okay, you increase leisure, but what else? Yeah. You might increase it just to like cover um, taxes, so you might work like. Yeah. What do we What do we call the two effects? Income and substitution. Exactly. We have substitution and income effects. The substitution effect would say your net wage is lower. Your net wage just went from $20 an hour to $16 an hour, right? So a lower net wage, you work less, but the income effect says you work more because you're now effectively poorer. When you're poorer, you consume less of everything, including leisure. So when you tax my wage, I might work, I might take less leisure, i.e. work more, through the substitution effect. I'm sorry, we tax my wage, I might take more, I might take more leisure, i.e. work less, through the substitution effect, because the returns to work are lower. But I might take less leisure, i.e. work more, because I'm now poorer. So we don't know what's going to happen. But we typically assume substitution effects dominate. You can't go wrong in this class without making that assumption, okay? We want you to remember the trade-off. But typically, we assume substitution effects dominate. So we typically think people will work less. We think taxing people will cause them to work less. But be clear, it's not obvious it will. But we typically think that's the result. And typically, once again, when you average men and women, as we discussed in our labor supply lecture, overall, you get an, an upward sloping labor supply curve. That is, overall, if you tax people, they'll work less. OK? So what that does is it lowers the hours of work for person C. This is our leaks in the bucket. We've suddenly massively reduced the amount, potentially massively, reduced the amount people want to work. Why do we care? We care because of figure 21.9. What have we done? We've gone from an initial point where people initially were supplying S, had initial supply curve of S1 and demand curve of D, and therefore we're supplying L1 hours of, le of labor at a wage W1. Now they're, pr they're producing less. Their supply curve shift in. That's created a dead weight loss. There is less stuff being produced because people are staying home rather than working. And the key point is that's not a problem. OK, staying home rather than working is not a problem. The problem is they're staying home only because we've reduced the price of labor. We've, we've increased the price. We've reduced the price of leisure. I'm sorry. We've, re we've reduced the return to labor. We've reduced the price of leisure. As a result, People are staying home. We've distorted their behavior. We've caused them to stay home and not work. We caused them to stay home and not work. There's less stuff for the rest of us. So there's a dead weight loss. So efficiency falls. And that is the efficiency equity trade off. This dead weight loss is Oaken's leak. That's the leak in Oaken's bucket. So now we have the trade off. On the one hand, we have an incredibly unequal society where a program like this could really make people better off, take money from rich people who don't need it. Give it to poor people who do. On the other hand, in doing so, we're going to have less stuff in society. We're going to shrink the size of the pie in order to redistribute the slices of the pie. Is it worth it? That's where the social welfare function comes in. The social welfare function allows you to evaluate whether something like this is worth it. Without a social welfare function, you can never answer that question. You just can't, because there's the one hand and the other hand. What a social welfare function does is give you a mathematical representation that allows you to answer that question. So in section on Friday, you work through an example of using a social welfare function to evaluate a welfare pro a transfer program like this. Okay? And then we'll come back on Monday and talk more about taxation.